we live in peculiar times. Would you agree? Yes. We live in a really unique opportunity to spread the gospel. We live in a unique time when people are hungry for truth. People are hungry for the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came out of the desert, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. He went by the leading of the Holy Spirit into the desert. Stacy and I saw that desert earlier this year. The desert wilderness that Jesus went into is not like what I always envision, like the Sahara Desert. He went into a rocky, mountainous desert area, uh, very close to the Dead Sea. Uh, and there is very little life. We drove an hour outside of Jerusalem to the Dead Sea through the desert, through the wilderness, if you will. Uh, and I don't know how many miles, but it was about an hour bus ride, um, maybe 30, 40 miles of just desolate places. The Bible says that Jesus went into the desert and the, and the devil tempted him. And Jesus overcame the enemy. Can I get an Amen. Every temptation that Jesus would face in the future, he had already faced with the devil in the desert. So when the Sadducees would say, hey, prove who you are, show off, show us that you're God, he's like, man, I've already been tempted by the devil to do the same thing. I don't need your, your little, you know, just get out of here. Can I get an amen? When people would, would try to tempt him with things or material things, he would say, listen, I've already faced that temptation in the desert. God took Jesus through temptation. He took him through a wilderness. Sometimes God does the very same thing with us. He takes us through what we would call a wilderness period. And we're facing trial. We're facing some tribulation. We're facing some, some things that we don't want to face. Can I get an amen? It's not a pleasant place. The wilderness is not a pleasant place. But Jesus says, if you'll overcome this, <clears throat> then the temptations and the trials that you face in your ministry or in your future, in your life, those will be child play because you've already overcome them in the desert time. Can I get an amen? So when Jesus comes out of the desert, he says something very, very peculiar. He says, the kingdom of God, say that with me, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is here. His first message, his first statement was repent, turn away from that which you're doing. Recognize that the kingdom is right here with me. What I do is re representative of what God is doing in heaven. What I am doing is representative of how God thinks. What I do, what I say is representative of what the king of kings, the creator of the universe, Jehovah El Elyon, the most high God, almighty, the father, what I do, what I say, how I act, how I treat people, I am bringing to you the king's mindset, the king's resources, what I bring to you is the kingdom of heaven and how it operates. So if you look at the life of Jesus, he talked repeatedly about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. So much so, he said, if you want to know how to pray, pray like this, our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. And then here's the kicker. Thy, say it with me, thy kingdom. Let's say it like we mean it. Thy kingdom. One more time. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come to earth. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. If we're not careful... We will get so inundated with what's happening on earth. We'll start to look at what's happening politically on earth. What's happening economically on earth. What's happening with morality and ethics on earth. What's happening with the position of one nation against another nation. What's happening in the culture of war on earth. 
what's happening with education, what's happening with television, what's happening with our favorite reality series, what's happening with our family, what's happening with our kids, what kind of world are our kids and our kids' kids going to be raised in. If we're not careful, we will be tempted by the enemy to stay focused on this peripheral level in which we can see. There's a big fancy word called ecclesia, which means the church being the governing body on earth. We are not to just see and go, woe is me, woe is the world, the place is going to hell in a handbasket, I don't know what I'm going to do. We are to change the atmosphere. We are to pray down heaven on this place. We are to say, thy kingdom come. God, your will be done on earth. God, just like your kingdom is in heaven, just like your will is executed effortlessly and, and wholeheartedly in heaven, God, your kingdom come to the White House. God, your kingdom come and reign on Washington, D.C. God, your kingdom come to the Pentagon. God, your kingdom come to the Education Mountain. God, your kingdom come to Nashville, to Hollywood, to New Orleans, to Las Vegas. Your kingdom come to this space. God, your will be done in this space. God, your will saturate the will of man. God, Jesus fought his own will. Jesus in the garden said, I don't want to go to the cross. God, is there any other way? Is there, could this cup go past me, God? Is there anything else? Is there any, <coughs> is there any other option, Jesus? Uh, any other option, God? And God in his love and his mercy says, my son, my Savior, my Redeemer, my boy, my will is that you go to the cross. My will, my kingdom demands your sacrifice. My kingdom's will, my kingdom's will. Jesus had the opportunity to say no because he was fully God, but yet fully man. But in his perfect example for us, he said, Oh God, let your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Can I get an amen? amen. God is calling us to call down heaven. Not to glorify and bring up hell. What we do, what our propensity to do, what we fight is to look at what hell is doing and to bring that up in our conversation. Let me bring up to you the, the dynamics of hell. Let me bring up to you the dynamics of what evil is doing. Let me bring up to you all the confusion of gender identity. Let me bring up to you all the co political chaos and the, the laptop's got this image on it and the laptop's got this information and let's, let's bring up what's going on here and bring up hell God does not say bring up hell. He says bring down heaven. Call down heaven and hell will be pushed back to its place. Can I get an amen? He said my kingdom come. My will. Not the will of the denomination. My will. Not your will, Cameron. Cameron, I'm going to have to break your will. I give you free will. But Cameron, if you want to be in my kingdom, if you want to be in my presence, then you're going to have to fight the good fight. You're going to have to run the race to win. And your will will not want to fight. Your will will, will, will be to succumb to the pressure and just fall into formation and go with the flow. Your desire, Cameron, won't be to finish the race. Your desire will be to quit because the race will demand every ounce of your will to be subject to my will. My peace I give to you, Jesus says. You will have peace that passes your understanding. Just say this, God's ways 
are higher or bigger than my ways. His thoughts, say thought, put your hands right here on your temple. His thoughts are a lot cleaner. They're a lot more pure. They're a lot more holy. His motives, his agenda, his thoughts are not my thoughts. His thoughts are perfect. Can I get an amen? He says, Cameron, I'm going to call you to think a certain way. I'm going to call you to walk through a certain place. I'm going to call you out of comfortability. I'm going to demand of you things that you won't think you're capable of giving to me. But Cameron, I'll give you peace that passes your thoughts. I'll give you peace that passes your ability to comprehend the circumstance. I'll give you peace when you want to run. I'll give you peace that passes your understanding. You won't know why I'm calling you to do this. You won't know why I'm demanding this. You won't know why I need you to do this. But just like Jesus, if you'll submit your will through tears, through blood, sweat, tears, crying in agony, calling your friend saying, why are you failing me? Why can't you stay with me in this race? Why aren't you with me? Jesus says this, though the world pass away, though the mountains melt, my will, my word, my agenda, my thoughts, my peace will not pass away. Things of this world are fleeting. Things of this world are temporary. But I'm stable. I'm the true north. I am the great I am. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man gets to the Father but through me. Jesus is calling you to a place He's calling something out of you. What I love about God is he calls pride out. Listen, there's a verse that you've heard your whole life. It says pride comes before the what? Let's just say it like we mean it. Pride comes before. Pride comes before. One more time. Pride comes before the fall. Cameron, I don't want you to fall. Cameron, I want you to run the race to win. Cameron, I don't want you to fail. I'm going to call out of you pride. And if you do fall, a righteous man gets up seven times. Though he falls again, he gets back up. Cameron, I'll call out of you your pride. I'll, I'll put into you humility. I'll call out of you arrogance. And I'll put into you kindness. I'll call out of you fear. And I'll put into you courage. I'll call out of you anxiety and put into you peace. I'll call out of you suicide and I'll put into you life. I'll call out of you death and I'll put into you hope. But it's my will, my kingdom. Your will, Cameron, has to submit to my will. You want to get into my kingdom. The gate is not wide. You want to get into my presence. Not all dogs go to heaven, nor do all people go to heaven. Can I get an amen? amen? Jesus says, narrow is the gate. Narrow is the way. Narrow. Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus, the man, we got all line up behind him. Can I get an amen? That's a pretty narrow path. If we're all single file behind one man, can I get an Amen. We live in a world that wants to bring up hell, wants to bring up evil. It wants to confuse what's good. It wants to call that which is evil good and that which is good evil. It wants to constantly bring chaos and confusion, panic and worry. We live in a world where we have panic rooms. We live in a world where we have a drug for every mental or emotional circumstance that you walk through. Don't deal with it, just medicate it. Don't live it, just skip it. There was a movie with Adam Sandler, came out a few years ago, called, I think it was called Click, and he had a remote control, like a supernatural remote control, and he could just fast forward through a boring ballet 
You know, if he, you know, dad, do you ever have to go to a ballet? You know, I mean, I know that's great and all, but you're like, oh God, when's this going to be over? Or you could fast forward through a monotonous day at work or fast forward. You could just, just escape through the monotony of life. The world says, be who you want to be. Do what you want to do. God says, be who I made you to be. Do what I created you to do. You have a purpose. You have a plan. You have a race. You have a lane. You need to stay in your lane. You need to run your race. You need to fight to win. You need the kingdom of heaven to come down. Can I get an amen? amen. Acts 17. Acts 17, Paul is in a city much like ours. And there's a lot of confusion. Paul is in a city, much like ours, where there's a lot of motives. Paul lived in a city where there was a lot of busyness. There was a lot of escapism. There was a lot of perversion. There was a lot of greed. There was a lot of good things going on. There was a lot of monotonous things going on. But he found himself in a theological battle because as it was his agenda, as it was his MO, Paul would seek out people that he could talk to about God. And he comes to a place in this specific city where they are questioning who is God. Sounds like our city. Who is God? Well, hey, preacher, I believe in God. I'm a good person. I believe in God. Very few people truly stand by an agnostic or atheistic viewpoint. Very few people say, I don't believe in God and really, really mean it. Can I get an amen? The old saying is, every atheist in a foxhole starts to believe in God. There's a lot of truth to that. But I would say 99.9% .9 of our world believes in something bigger than themselves. It could be fortune and fame. Hey, if I could just get rich, if I could just have money like Bill Gates, then I would be good. Well, that's their God. If I could just have all the partners and the freedom sexually that I could have, then I would just, I, I would, I would, that, would, that would be my God. If I could just have a good family, good kids, good, good life, if I could just educate the world better, if we could just education, and we have a God, can I get an amen? We have a philosophy we have a theology, and it's bigger than we are. Paul found himself in a city where they're asking the question, who is God? We live in that city. Can I get an amen? amen. There are about 386 different choices this morning for you to go and worship 386 different gods in some sort of unified service around this space. The newest church out there is the God, and I mean this literally, the God of marijuana. So we'll all get together, smoke some dope, and we'll experience God together. We'll sing to him. We'll listen to somebody talk about him. And we'll find enlightenment through substance. No joke. I wish I was making it up. You can find something that you want to call God. You can call the tree God. You can say, Pastor, I just sit on my back porch. I just drink some coffee and I just talk. To, I just experience God as nature. God is love. You know, I see God in the birds and I see God in the grass and I see God in the, in the wind. And listen, you may see God in what he created, but the creator is not the created. The creator created something. So we don't worship what he created. Can I get an amen? Who is God? Listen to this out of Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Areopagus. I, er, I can't say the word all of a sudden. Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. Say religious. We don't use that word today. What's the word that we've replaced religious with? What's the word? Somebody say it. Say it like we mean it. Spiritual. I'm spiritual. I'm, listen, listen, I'm mindful. Oh, oh, let's be mindful. Listen, listen, that's not the same definition it was 20 years ago. 
So you need to be careful what you're saying. Careful what you're practicing. Oh, we're going to practice mindfulness. Listen, that is a religious spirit behind that, and it's not from your Bible. I'm just telling you. Here we go. I perceive in all things you're very religious, for I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. I was passing through downtown Austin and considered the objects that people worship. I considered the building. I considered the capital. I considered the shops that sold different little dolls and gimmicks and crystals and charms and rocks. And I considered the things that people worship. Have you ever driven your city and considered the things that people worship? Have you? Have you ever considered what is happening I even found this altar in Austin, Texas to the unknown God. Paul was in an environment where they worship numerous gods. These gods originated at the Tower of Babel and when God confused the language about 70 different table of nations came out of Babel, about 70 different languages They all called the God of Babel by 70 different names as they dispersed over centuries, decades and centuries throughout the land. They still referenced the same God of Babel. They just called him by a different name. That's why you'll see all the similar patterns in world religions. God looks at the table of nations. He looks at the 70 nations. He says, I am God. None of these 70 call God by who I am. And he said, I'll make my own nation. Abraham, leave the nation. Leave the gods of the Chaldeans and come and follow me. And a boy or a man named Abram started to follow God. Can I get an amen? And God made his own nation. And said, I will reveal to you who I am. I am that I am. I am God. And I don't need statues built to me. I don't need stones harvested from the earth and chiseled with perfection to hang around your neck to worship me. I don't need you to connect your chi or your energy or your inner self. I don't need you to look inside yourself to find enlightenment. I need you to look up and look at your God. And I need you to call down heaven and say, God, let your kingdom come to my kingdom. Let me not bring up to you something from a low-level position of a created earth and try to give you something. God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. God, you created the stars. God, you stored the snow and you bring it out in certain seasons. God, you were there when birth was given for the first time, when, when when the first breath was taken. Paul says this to the unknown God, therefore, verse 23, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. So what I love about Paul, he said, oh, listen, you worship the unknown God. Hey, you're worshiping. Let me tell you who he is. We live in a world that is desperately hungry for the real God. They're waiting for you to show them The real God. Paul says, let me tell you who he is. Verse 24, listen to this worldview. Listen to Paul's description. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed something. Since he is the one who gives life, since he is the one that gives breath, and he gives all things, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Listen to what it just said. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed time. Just say, God determined my pre-appointed life. He had determined pre-appointed lives and boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him. When is the last time we groped for God? 
my definition of grope would be when I can't see, like when I'm blinded, when it's really dark, and I'm just kind of gra- I'm just kind of doing this number. I, I don't know, understand. I, I'm just like, when's the last time in my despair I groped and tried to find and grab hold of God? When was the last time in my pride or in my lust or in my confusion did I reach out and say, God, I'm just trying to grasp hold of you. I'm just trying to grab you. I'm groping, God. I'm looking for you. Paul says, if you will look and try to find God, you will find him. I was talking to a gentleman the other day and somebody else had an agenda for what I needed to tell him. Have you ever been in that position? You ever been in a position when, when you got to talk to somebody and somebody else is saying, now you need to go tell this guy that, that, and that. Or you need to make sure that, have you ever been there? Can, can I get an amen? Sometimes preachers get that a lot. Preacher, I need you to tell them about Jesus. I need you to save them. I'm like, dude, okay, I'm just going to talk to them. How about we just start there? But I was under some outside pressure. And the Lord said, do not say what they are wanting you to say. So I'm like, okay, you know. So I just said, hey, listen, if you really want to find God, if you really want to know who God is, all you got to do is say, hey, Jesus, I'm really trying to find you. Would you show yourself to me? And they consume that. Are you with me? Grope. Look at verse 26. Or where was I? Sorry. I lost my spot. Okay, here we go. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. How far is God from you? Have you ever felt far from him? (laughs) Maybe this morning. You ever felt far from him? Yeah, he, he's not far from you at all. He's just right there. How far is he from you? He's as close to you as he was to Peter who got so far from the boat. He got so far from the boat that a professional swimmer, a professional fisherman, and he was in such a tumultuous storm that he started to drown. He didn't just start to sink. Have you ever almost drowned? When you almost drowned, you are helpless. Like literally, you yourself can't get out of the situation. And Jesus was right there and said, come on. Set him back on the water. I don't think Jesus made him. It never tells us how he got back to the boat or got to shore. But either Peter walked all the way to shore with Jesus or Jesus walked. I don't think Jesus said, now swim back to the boat, you, you bad disciple. You big idiot. You a little faith. I think, I think Jesus said, Peter, let's try again. Let's walk some more. You are not far from God. Verse 28, for in him we live. And in God we move. And in God we have our being. Just say have our being. Let's say it like we mean it. Have our being. Do you know what that means? You know your identity. You have your, con- you have your identity, your being, your worth, your value. We live in a world that doesn't know who they are because they don't know who their God is. When you know who your God is, you know your being. We have our being. For in him we live, we move, we have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of of the divine nature like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. Can I just tell you the perversion that I see right now? The perversion that I see right now is when people say, that I can carve, make, shape, harness, or show you God. Have you ever built a new house? You ever gotten a new car? 
You ever gotten a big diamond ring or a fancy watch or a big paycheck? Have you ever fashioned and tried to show somebody who your God is? You ever seen somebody that worships what they've obtained? God's saying, you can't harness me. Verse 30, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Look at verse 30. That ought to bring you some hope. Did you know there was a time in your life when God overlooked some of your foolishness, some of your sin? But do you realize now he's saying, hey, you're way past that. You've been out of the third grade, Cameron, for a long time. Time to stop acting like a third grader. I overlooked that in a time, but now it's time. Verse 31, because he's appointed a day. And here's where this whole message started. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. Oh, God's a God of love. God just loves everybody. He just, you just go do whatever you want to do because you're sugar daddy God. He just loves you. You just do whatever makes you feel good. He doesn't have a will for you. He doesn't have rules for you. That's Old Testament stuff. Grace, grace, grace. God, grace, God, grace, grace, God, God, God. Listen, God loves you. Oh, he loves you. Oh, he's not mad at you. Oh, God is not furious at you. He's not upstairs. He's not an old man with a gavel or a two by four. God is not out there to get you, to trip you up. He's not shaking his head in disgust. He loves you. But scripture says, while it's still time, come to God. Because there is a day when in his love, he will have to judge. And he will hold us accountable for what we have done as Christians, as Christ followers. After salvation is when our work begins. Pre-salvation, I, please don't take this out of context. God is the one that does it all. Can I give you an amen? But I'm just saying there's nothing you can do to get saved. God saves you, but he saves you so that you can go do the things he's called you to do. We have missed that message in the church. How many people got saved last year? Well, brother, we, got, we led 94 people to the Lord. Man, that's awesome. Hey, how many of those 94 went and did the thing God saved them to do? Man, that should be the number. Oh, man, 94 of them. They went and did this and that. You wouldn't believe it. Truly, times of ignorance got overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Repent. Just say repent. Because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Let me tell you, verse 32, and when they heard the resurrection of Jesus, some mocked. Others said, oh, whatever, we'll, we'll listen to this guy some other time. The next verse says, others believed and followed. Listen, God's calling you, God's gifted you, God's ushering you into a new season. He is saying to you, get in the race, get off the bench, go do the thing that I called you to do. Call down the kingdom of heaven, call down the resources of God. Call down the boldness of heaven. Be like an Elijah and call down fire. Call down healing. Bring the healing hand of God to the sick. Bring the healing hug of God to the brokenhearted. Bring the healing name of Jesus to the demon possessed and the demon tormented. Bring the healing love of Jesus Christ to a lost and hurting world. Can I get an amen? 
bring correction to an erring brother or sister. Bring truth to a Christian that may have gotten away from the truth. Bring truth back into your own life. Can I get an amen? amen? God is calling something out of you just like he called out of Jesus in the garden. Jesus was perfect, so please don't misunderstand. Jesus was showing us the struggle between his will and God's will. Our will and God's will. God is saying, let my kingdom come. My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. God, I need a daily dose of heaven. I need a daily dose of you, God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and pray. Father, we love you. And God, we bless you. Just say, Jesus, I bless you. God, I bless you. God, thank you for blessing me, but I bless you back. God, I bless you back. God, I bless you back. God, God, I bless you. I praise you. God, I adore you. God, I yearn for you. God, I, I call out to you. God, I need you. Jesus, thank you for blessing me. Just start to name the blessings God's given you. God, I thank you for my mom. I thank you for my dad. I thank you for my sister. I thank you for my brother. God, I thank you for my friends. God, I thank you for that teacher that really was, was uh, impactful in my life. God, I thank you for that employer. God, I thank you for my spouse. I thank you for my babies. God, I thank you for my friends. God, I thank you for that, that air conditioning that you got repaired for me. God, I thank you for that, that bonus check that you gave me out of the blue and I was able to pay that bill. Just thank God for how he's blessed you. God, I thank you that I can sleep at night. God, I thank you that you've forgiven me and shame doesn't rule me anymore. God, I thank you for pulling out fear and death and putting in life. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. God, thank you for blessing me. God, could I bless you? What if God asked you to bless him? What can you give God? God, I just bless you <clears throat> with my words. God, I bless you with my song. God, I, I bless you in the early morning hours in, in dancing before you. God, I bless you by raising my hands. God, I, I bless you by turning the TV off and reading your word. God, I bless you by praying. God, I, I just bless you, God. I, I don't know what else to say, but I bless you, God. Say this with me. God, I give you my will. God, I give you that inner man, that inner woman. God, I give you that inner, that inner struggle to submit to you. God, I give that to you. I give you my will. I give you my will, God. And I, God, I, I just exchange it for your will. God, I ask that your will would rule my life. In the little things and the big things, God. God, I really want to watch that movie. But God, it's not in your will for me. So God, I, I, I turn it off. God, I really want to call that person back and cuss them out. I want to stand up for myself. God, it's not in your will for me to curse those that curse me. I, God, it's your will to bless those that curse God, I really want. We all have a will. And God says, Jesus says, let me teach you how to pray. Let me teach you how to be. Thy kingdom come, God. Thy will be. God, I really want you to blow up all those people. I want to put them on an island. I want to blow them all up and get them out of my world, God. I really want you to, to, to do bad things to that bad person, God. I really want them to pay for what they did. I want them to pay. I want them to, God, I really want them to burn in hell. But God, not my will, not my will, but your will, your kingdom. 
God, I submit to you. God, I don't want to write that check. I don't want to, God, I really want a new car. I don't want to give that, that, that to, the, to your kingdom. I don't want to do that. God, I, I worked hard for, this is mine. It's okay to argue with God. It's okay to tell God your will. But at the end, you gotta be like Jesus and say, it's not my will, but let your will be done on earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. If you need to submit your will to God, would you just raise your hand? All eyes are closed. If you just need to submit your will, if you're struggling in this soul area of your man, just give your hands to God. God, I pray that every hand that is raised, God, that you'll meet us at the point where our will is fighting your will. And God, in your love and your gentleness and in your creativeness and in your boldness and in your ability to stand firm, God, would you just direct us and help us to trust your will. In Jesus' name, and everyone said.